Do we need socialism in the United States? If you like today's video, do click the like button and subscribe and click the notifications bell so you don't miss any of our future videos. Down below in the description, you can buy me a coffee and you also have a link to some books I have for sale. With that, let's get on with our subject. Some people say, I don't want to live under socialism, but there is no such thing. We do not live under an economic system, which is what socialism is. Likewise, we do not live under capitalism. We live within, as we'll see, a mixed economy and live under the Constitution. So that statement, I don't want to live under socialism, or a question, do you want to live under socialism, is absolutely irrelevant to anything related to the topic of socialism. The economy affects everyone, and some call for more or less government action. What is the framework of our economy? Many people say the United States is a capitalistic economy, but this leaves out important elements. Capitalism is a market economy based on ownership of the means of production and or distribution of goods and or services in private hands, or in public hands in terms of stockholders of a corporation, with buying and selling under a market system. This could be subdivided into regulated or non-regulated by the government. Socialism is government ownership of the means of production and or distribution of goods and or services. It does not rule out personal private property. Communism is initially government allocation of goods and services, which Marx said would eventually lead to a communist society with no money used and no government. Therefore, we can say that no country has ever been communist. But that does not stop allocation from being part of a mixed economy. An example of regulated capitalism is the stock market. There is a market economy, but you and I cannot go off and buy stock or sell stock on our own. We have to go through a broker. So only certain people are actually allowed to buy and sell stock on behalf of the public. It is a regulated capitalism, but it's definitely both regulated and capitalism. An example of non-regulated capitalism is a garage sale. An example of socialism is a public library. Filling a need that capitalism will not fill. If someone comes to you with a plan and says, we're going to open up a private library that will compete with the public library and will buy thousands of books and ebooks and make them available to the public for free and we'll make our money by collecting the overdue fines. Turn, put your hand on your wallet and walk away as fast as you can. That is a money losing proposition. It will not work that way. Communism is the library allocation. My public library allows 35 articles to be checked out at one time. I can walk in. A billionaire can walk in, and a grade school student with no money in her pocket can walk in, and we are all subject to the same allocation of no more than 35 articles. We have lots of socialism, Social Security and Medicare. We have a candidate for Congress in my district accusing his opponent of being a liberal who wants to turn Medicare into socialism, but it's been socialism since 1965. So one thing I will not do is vote for an uninformed candidate. And we have city fire departments, which are socialist. More about that later. Most city bus systems, most professional football stadiums are government entities, which enable a capitalist enterprise of a football team. For various reasons, the profits are in owning the football team, but the losses are in owning the stadium. So an investor will strongly resist any plan to put his own money into a stadium, and that includes the people who own the team. They don't want to put money into a losing proposition such as the stadium, they want to put money into a winning proposition such as the team. In a football example, there are 16 National Football League games a year, eight home and eight away, and not counting exhibition games and the Super Bowl. Therefore, if we build a stadium, we start off with only having an occupant eight days out of the year. You wouldn't open a hotel with your own money if that is your starting point, having guests in your hotel eight days out of the year. There will be auto shows and other events, but they already have venues if they're already coming in. You can approach them and offer more service and lower price, but do enough of that, and you will lose more money with every event you bring in. Remember that you have a monthly payment on the stadium. Actually, if it's socialist, it's usually public bonds to borrow the money, and it usually will be socialist. And you have the operating expenses. Even when there is nothing going on, you need lights on, burglar and fire alarms on, and security people walking around. Uh, some people say, but if capitalism took over the bus system, they would figure out how to make it profitable. No one can explain to me how that is possible. Local public transportation was generally capitalistic for many years, starting with small horse-drawn wagons, then motorized buses, before the private car was common. Early in the 20th century, private cars began to replace the horse and wagon, 
as well as motorized buses replacing the horse and wagon. Then the Depression hit, and after that, civilian production was converted to military production for World War II. Later, in the 1950s and 1960s, it became not uncommon for a family to be a two-car family for husband and wife, and then additional cars in the family when the teenagers got their licenses. So who needed public transportation? People who can't drive, perhaps for medical reasons, or can't afford a car, or can't afford a second car. People who are too young to drive. So it is needed as a public utility. In fact, capitalism failed, and socialism was needed to fill the public need. On some buses I have been on, there are lifts that bring people in wheelchairs up into the bus and then off the bus. If it was a capitalistic enterprise, management might say, it costs so much to fit the buses with lifts and only occasional passengers are in wheelchairs, so we wouldn't make enough money selling them fares to pay for the lift. It's not a profitable investment, so we won't do it. Were this the case, the lifts wouldn't happen, and those people so much in need would be left behind unless you had government regulation requiring it. And there we get into regulated capitalism, which isn't socialism. A government entity doesn't own the bus system in this case. Some people say the government doesn't know how to run a business better than capitalistic management. Therefore, business shouldn't be regulated by the government. They should run it as they see fit. But capitalism exists to make a profit. The financial classes teach the purpose of a capitalistic enterprise is to maximize the owner's wealth. The sociology classes teach the purpose of a capitalistic enterprise is to seek a profit while taking into consideration the interests of all stakeholders, the ownership, labor, customers, suppliers, not just the stockholders. We keep ending up in pretty much the same place. So management does not want to do something that will interfere with subjective. Another example is that capitalism wants to cut costs and many companies have moved production overseas. That doesn't change unless there is government action duties, quotas, or something. The companies will not move to where costs are higher unless they must. More socialism. Utah is a system of state-owned liquor stores, which are socialist. Sometimes someone comes along in Utah and says, well, let's shut down the socialist liquor stores and sell the whole operation to a capitalistic enterprise. A lot of money will come flowing into the state treasury that way. And a lot of other people, a majority say, well, that's true, but that means we aren't going to be seeing the profits coming in every year from now through infinity from the annual liquor sales. Liquor is a very profitable business. North Dakota has a socialist bank of North Dakota, and the people of North Dakota love their socialist bank. So, city fire departments. In colonial days, there were capitalist firefighting companies. You would pay an annual fee and they would give you a plaque to put by your door, identifying that's the company you subscribe to. This was based on the insurance model. You buy fire insurance in advance from a capitalist insurance company and you are covered by that policy from that company. Another company will not honor your claim because you are not one of their customers. So if you have a fire, you send someone to run to the firehouse. No telephones or electrically operated fire alarms yet in colonial days. When they get there, if they're out on a call, Your messenger and you will just have to wait until they return. If your house burns down in the meantime, that's the way it goes. Other companies will not respond, and you can't pay them once you have the fire. Just as you can't go to an insurance company and say, my house is burning down, and now I would like to buy insurance. Some people of means paid every available company to have multiple plaques so they could send out several messages and be relatively sure someone would respond, perhaps more than one fire company. Eventually, cities began to establish their own taxpayer-supported fire departments. This is capitalism replaced by socialism. Everyone pays in. Everyone has protection. If it's a small town, these often have mutual assistance agreements. If the Little Fairy, New Jersey Fire Department is on a call, South Hackensack or Hackensack or Richfield Park can respond. Of the four towns I've named, only Hackensack is a paid taxpayer-supported fire department. The others have volunteer fire departments who are very dedicated and civic-minded people around the country. Interesting structure. The taxpayers supply socialist government-owned buildings and equipment, and so it is socialism supporting a volunteer effort. Some people say the United States has the best economy in the world, and I will agree. Some add the United States has the best economy in the history of the world, and I will agree. Then some say, and I don't want any socialism in the United States, which contradicts their first two statements, unless they can prove the socialist elements that I have named do not help us have the best economy, the best society in the history of the world. So in the end, we have a mixed economy of capitalism and socialism and a dash of communism. Is this essential to an advanced society? 
all advanced societies seem to have the mixed economy. The mixed structure is a natural structure and it existed in primitive societies. Suppose you are a pottery maker. You own your own shop and your supplies and are running a capitalist operation. You need water for your shop, for your family, and there's a common well that is owned by the tribe, socialism. There is a healthy spring that keeps feeding the well so you take all you need. That is fed by underground streams, which the primitive population doesn't understand, but they know there's always enough water. You also need firewood. The forest is owned by the tribe, but the tribe understands that when you cut down the tree, it takes years for it to be replaced by new growth. And so we can't allow everyone to just take all they want. There has to be some allocation by the tribal leaders. And that is the principle of communism. We all need wood for the warmth of a fireplace and for cooking, but the blacksmith needs more to keep his fire blazing hot all day, long before Karl Marx. Some Americans have difficulty with the matter because they don't understand. So people who say, I don't want any socialism in the United States, often add, because it's bad for the American people. We've already dismissed that argument. But their foundation is that they often define socialism as that is when the government tells you what to do. And that's what they don't want. But that isn't the correct definition. If we take the definition, though, and their reasoning to be against socialism in the United States, then they have to be opposed to every traffic signal, every stop sign, and every speed limit in the United States. That they should be done away with for the good of the American people. But it's all based on a false definition, which I don't understand where it came from. I will just add that sometimes capitalism gives things away, such as a cologne sample to help you become interested in buying the product. But capitalism does seek a profit. Socialism doesn't. So here in the city of Phoenix, you can pay a fare and ride the socialist buses around town. But downtown, there's a free socialist bus called a Circulator that takes passengers around the downtown area at no charge. It is totally paid for by the taxpayers. You could ride it all day for free. The concept is that the free transportation can become an attractive alternative to driving and cuts down on congestion and pollution. So that is an example of a totally subsidized transportation with zero income from it, zero, to serve the public interest. As far as when the government tells you what to do, in some cases, such as the speed limits and so on, that is a natural function of government to regulate the society for the good of the members of the society. If it goes too far, then we can have authoritarianism. Uh, Hitler, Putin, others believe in authoritarianism and we don't. If you liked today's video, found it interesting and informative, do leave a like and subscribe to the notifications bell to be notified of our future videos the moment they are published. Check out the books available down in the description as well. Thank you for joining me today.